Mother Anne Lee, although unschooled herself, recognized, as does everyone who is taught of God, the necessity of training and developing the intellectual and spiritual faculties, as well as the ability of the hands. Mother Lucy Wright, who followed her, attained high rank as a writer and judge of literary excellence. She always trained her people in correct habits of speech and correct and easy ways of composition. Mother Lucy felt strongly the necessity of a thorough education for the children in Shaker homes and early instituted a system of schools. The first notice of education in this place was in 1793 when the youth and children were instructed by John Bishop. The time afforded was very slight, but was more than was given to most children in the town. As they had no schoolhouse, the teacher and pupils were accommodated wherever it was found most convenient. It was arranged at this time to give the boys some advantage about 20 minutes was offered each noon for them to receive instruction in reading and in spelling. For several years, the school was conducted in this way. Another class was held two evenings each week that this same group might be instructed in penmanship. Several of the class, Elder Henry Blinn records, tells he became a fine penman. John Whitcher, son of Benjamin Whitcher, who gave his farm as a nucleus of this society, was one of the pupils in this school, and his education would compare favorably with any person in the town at that time. The girls had no opportunity to attend school until the year 1806, when they were privileged to attend for one hour six evenings a week to take lessons in penmanship. Many of these pupils obtained birch bark upon which to write, as paper was too expensive. In 1805, Hannah Brunson had charge of the school, which was kept in a barn at the North family. The children had to sit on the floor or provide themselves with a block or a box. Lessons in reading and spelling only were given. Webster's spelling books, primers, and the New Testament were books used. When tired of study, the boys were employed in learning to set card teeth used in carders for carding wool and cotton in the preparation for thread and the girls spent the time in learning to knit. The time for recreation was during the intermission at noon. The next teacher was John Witcher. He held school for the next several years, but only through the winter season. At this time, the young sisters attended, were taught to write, and were given a few lessons in arithmetic. Some of the writing books were pieces of birch bark. Up to 1814, pupils had not been instructed from an arithmetic book as they had none, but some of the sisters, by perseverance, had learned the four fundamental rules. But having no slates, paper, or books, they made slow progress. Necessity suggested many ways to acquire this so much desired education. They ciphered, as they called it, on wood or bark, and even if need be, on cloth. Some of the brothers were equally earnest to learn. In 1817, Phoebe Bailey held a school in a room at the second family for the girls in summer and the boys in winter. All the pupils in the society attended at their appointed time. Sister Marsha Hastings, 
to whom we are indebted for many of these notes, was a pupil in 1822. She says, we had no arithmetics, but our teachers procured small billets of wood, or some beans, or kernels of corn, and with these we learned the process of addition, subtraction, and so forth. This exercise was amusing as well as instructive. They were taught a little of geography also. Seth Y. Wells, who had been an elder at Waterfleet's second family, was released from all other cares in 1821 and appointed General Superintendent of Believers' Literature in the first bishopric, which included Waterfleet, Mount Lebanon, and Hancock. Brother Seth, a native of Long Island, New York, was a man of sterling integrity, intellectual ability, and possessing a classical education, had, previous to his 30th year, been a teacher in the public schools of Albany and an instructor in Hudson Academy. Uniting with the Shakers at the age of 30, his special ability in legal and literary matters was soon recognized. He visited this community in 1823 and spent about two weeks with the brothers and sisters, giving them instructions in teaching education. Among the books used at this time were the New Testament, Easy Lessons, The New York Reader, Jackson's Arithmetic, Ingersoll's Grammar, and Gould's Penmanship. The schoolhouse was built in 1823 and occupied in 1824, whence all the books were carried to be used by all the pupils. This was a great step forward on the road of progress. More interest was to be given in the education of the children. The boys were to have a term of 12 weeks in the winter and the girls the same number in the summer. There were often as many as 30 and sometimes over 50 boys and as many girls. As time went on, many books were added to the teacher's library such as a rhetorical reader, rules for punctuation, and lessons in enunciation. For the children's use for one year, they bought 13 writing books, 100 quills, 200 slate pencils, a globe, and one ream of paper. They also bought a box-like couch for the little children, costing $1. This was a comfortable place in which to put the sleepy children. The prices of that day might be interesting to compare with the prices of today. One bunch of about a hundred quills, 32 cents. A bunch of matches, two cents. A broom, 34 cents. A choir of paper, 17 cents. And one bottle of ink, 17 cents. Here is an interesting item. Money was scarce in those days, but an expenditure of about one dollar was made for peppermints and other candies, which no doubt much, were much appreciated by the children. We also read of toys and picture books being bought at various times, and so it seems that school had its lighter side, too. One dozen steel pens were obtained in 1847, which were used, as we are told, with the utmost care, as they were so very expensive. These 12 pens cost 28 cents, while 12 of the best quill pens cost but 6 cents. The work of making and keeping quill pens in repair was considerable, and yet good penmen thought it was easier to shade the writing, that is, make it more artistic with a quill, and favored keeping the goose quill, which had been all the writing tool they had ever known. However, a box of steel pens was bought for the school, 
and from this time quills were more and more at a discount. The work of preparing and mending quill pens for some forty or more pupils and to keep them in order while being used for an hour each day was a patient's trying task and the teachers were happy to be done with it. Lead pencils had also been introduced about 1825. About this time, the study of physiology was taken up, and from then on, very few children who attended Shaker School failed to be able to trace the passage of food through the digestive tract, name the bones and many of the muscles of the body, or trace the circulation of the blood. A box of chalk crayon was purchased for the blackboards. We had until then used pieces or lumps of chalk, which were quite unsuitable. We had also dug some clay in the meadow, and mixing it with chalk, had tried to make crayons. We were partially successful, but at last concluded to buy our chalk crayon. Another book supplied for the older class in school was Governmental Instructions, whereby the children became acquainted with government procedure, from town meetings to national government. Though Shakers themselves did not vote or take part in the government for religious reasons. The Shaker family had owned a large Adams printing press for several years and had printed some hymns and several small pamphlets. Four persons were engaged in this work, three to set the type and one to do the press work. These four, however, had many other duties to perform in a day, apart from the work at the printing office. In 1849, they received the manuscript of a work entitled Holy and Divine Wisdom, written at Waterfleet. It was a book of nearly 700 pages and an edition of 2,500 copies. The publication proved a great undertaking, but they purchased a new Tufts hand press of excellent pattern, an inking machine, then made an addition to the stock of type. The management of this business was in charge of Elder Henry Blinn. As teacher of the winter school, Elder Henry took upon himself the task of printing a primary grammar and was amply rewarded for all his efforts, he writes, by being able to supply all the younger pupils with a series of lessons in grammar. Parker's practice and theory of teaching and elements of geology were added to the teacher's library. Colburn's first lessons in mental arithmetic was introduced into the studies, and it was a thrilling exercise to those who were interested. Also, elements of botany. In 1870, elocution was added and music used in the schools more than formerly. By the year 1880, Elder Henry, with some of the sisters, compiled what they called a repository of music containing elementary and advanced lessons selected from the works of able teachers, which all our young people were supposed to master, and the knowledge of note reading was quite general. Singing in parts was taught in the classes, and once a week there were concerts where the older people became the audience and young people entertained with solos, duets, trios, quartets, as well as choruses from the well-known oratorios, including the Hallelujah Chorus. This was a far cry from the early days when music books were unobtainable, and their teacher, Sister Asina Stickney, had composed little songs for her pupil. One song linked together all the names of the rivers of the northeastern part of the United States, from the St. John and the St. Croix in Maine to the Ohio River. Another helped them remember the different mountain chains. 
freehand drawing was introduced in the school, and Helen M. Perkins of Lebanon, New Hampshire, was hired to teach this department. Of course, this is a highly specialized course, and few ever qualified at first class in this field, but the opportunity was open to all. Also inserted in the curriculum was single and double entry bookkeeping and algebra for more advanced students. Among the names prominently mentioned as teachers would be found Marcia Hastings, Dorothy Durgin, Henry Blinn, Arthur Bruce, and Emma B. King, afterwards becoming members of the Elders' Order. Sister Athena Stickney and Jesse Evans also served about 40 years individually. As years passed, the time spent in the schoolroom increased to six hours a day and 36 weeks a year. But the year 1934 came at last, and the happy experience of school life had to end. The Depression had come, depriving us of the wherewithal to provide for the children. The societies for many years have kept well-stocked reading rooms and libraries. Flashy, cheap literature is discountenanced, but the best thought of the day is provided in books and magazines. From 1871 until 1900, they also published a periodical. For two years, it was edited at Waterfleet with George Albert Lomas as editor, under the name The Shaker. It was enlarged at Mount Lebanon under the able editorship of Elder Frederick Evans and Eldress Antoinette Doolittle, with a title Shaker and Shakeress from 1873 to 1878. Under the title The Manifesto, it continued from 1878 until 1900 at Canterbury, edited by Elder Henry Blinn. It was quite widely read and also formed a link between the societies whose loss, when it was discontinued, was severely felt. The theological and philosophical writings Shakers have manifested the same original and forceful intellectual life that in the daily routine of their vocation has expressed itself in practical devices and mechanical inventions. Shakers are not given to theological discussions, yet there have been theological writers among them of spiritual insight and convincing logic. Among works that stand preeminent is the Millennial Church, published at Mount Lebanon, in 1823. Elder Calvin Green tells of its origin. A Russian consul from New York visited them and requested an exposition of the faith and practice of believers that he might translate and publish it in Russia. Elder Calvin composed the work and when it was presented to the consul he felt believers should also publish it. Elder Calvin Green and Seth Y. Wells revised it, and it was printed. Christ's First and Second Appearing was a work published at Union Village, Ohio, in 1808, bearing the signatures of David Darrow, John Meacham, and Benjamin S. Youngs. Thomas Jefferson said of the work, I have read it many times and I pronounce it the best church history that was ever written. Sister Amelia Calver of Mount Lebanon wrote a biographical yearbook containing the names of 1,400 famous men and women and details about them, useful in the schools. There have been many more books published, among them we might mention the Life and Gospel Experience of Mother Anne Lee, Gentle Manners, A Guide to Good Morals by Henry Blinn, also books of poetry 
such as Mount Lebanon cedar boughs and the Berkshire wildflowers. More recently, some pamphlets have been written by present-day members. An activity which afforded much pleasure was the writing, staging, and acting of entertainments by the young people. Active in this work, which began as early as 1890, was Sister Josephine Wilson, who often staged large Bible scenes with many taking part. Christmas, Easter, and Midsummer, these entertainments of drama or comedy continued. Later, under the direction of Sister Ada Elam, until about 1935, once we staged a pageant of 103 characters with only about 30 actors taking part. Of course, quick changes of costume made this possible, and it was fun to work out the plan. For some years, we had a small orchestra of two violins, a cello, two saxophones, a cornet, and drums. Combining this with piano and organ, we gave many programs. Mr. Arthur Nevers of Concord, New Hampshire, was a fine instructor. We had a group of young people who played interesting programs on harmonicas, and the little children had a rhythm band which gave them joy. One evening a week was given to learning folk dancing, whereby grace of body as well as happy times were obtained. Monday night was designated as game night for many years. All the various groups gathered in their rooms, especially on winter evenings, where they had good times playing dominoes, checkers, flinch, pachisi, and all the games of that day. In the summer, very often croquet sets would be laid out on the lawn, and also ping pong and tennis for those who found pleasure in this pastime. While a screened-in summer house, well lighted, made it possible for those who enjoyed reading to do that. In the winter, popcorn parties were enjoyed by all. Sometimes as many as two barrels were popped for the occasion. Molasses boiled to the right consistency, and then it was made into delicious sticky corn balls. Everyone in the family was remembered with these confections. Molasses candy was pulled on the old-fashioned hook, while fudge and other candies were made on the bricked-in stove called an arch. In the meantime, games were being played, and great hilarity abounded. Picking fruit was also fun, because picnic dinners and suppers went along with it. Wild strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, each in its season we went out to gather while enjoying nature and the great out of doors. At the same time, we were preserving canned fruit for the winter table. In the fall came chestnuts when we would cook supper on the stones, and appling, the most pleasure of all, when hot dinners from broiled steak to delicious apple pie was brought right into the orchards directly from the kitchen. Fishing parties interested some at our ponds, while the gathering of wildflowers and hiking interested many of our young people. In later years, automobile trips through the mountains and to the seashore have been numerous, as well as longer trips. Today, the enjoyment of our youth is but a beautiful memory, for time in its flight has brought adulthood and with it many changes. But the gaiety and the laughter, the joy and the wholesome pleasure brings many a smile and sometimes a tear of nostalgia for the memory of those glorious, golden, sunset years of our youth.